All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Optech International 2020 Annual Shareholder Call. Please note that management's prepared remarks may contain forward-looking statements that are within the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements are identified by certain words or phrases such as may, will, aim, will likely result, expect, project, and similar expressions or variations of such expressions. These forward-looking statements are based on assumptions made by management regarding future circumstances over the company, may have little or no control and involve risks, uncertainties, and other factors that may cause actual results to be materially different from any future results expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. Some of these factors include, among others, the following, future financial performance, expected cash flow, ability to reduce costs, and improve operational efficiencies, re revenue growth, and increased sales volume. Please refer to our most recent forms 10Q and 10K and subsequent filings with OTC Markets and Securities and Exchange Commission for a further discussion of these risks and uncertainties. We disclaim any obligation or intent to update the forwarding looking statements in order to reflect events or circumstances discussed in this call. With us today is Roger Pawson and Chief Executive Officer of Optech International and advisory board members, uh, Steve Mandel and Kevin Harrington. At this time, Mr. Pawson will provide a brief update and overview of the company operations and answer questions that were submitted to our investor relations department and management. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Pawson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for participating today in the uh, Optech annual shareholder meeting. Of course, due to the pandemic, uh, this is the new now, so we're here today doing this via Zoom and probably for some time to come. So um, in short, what we're going to uh, outline to you today are some of the topics regarding the company's status for the past year, uh, some of its projections, and a lot of the questions that we consolidated best way we could due to the uh, large number of uh, questions that were actually sent in by shareholders, um, and we, we've consolidated them down to about 15 or 16 answers, which I hope will suffice uh, to, to everyone on the call today. So having said that, um, moving forward, I'm going to take those questions one at a time, and as I said earlier, I think collectively, uh, we, we should be able to reach the results that everyone's looking for today. So uh, joining us on the call today is uh, Kevin Harrington, uh, advisory board member and a valuable member of our team. And uh, Kevin will be speaking uh, later during this webinar today. So having said that, uh, welcome, Kevin. Thank you today. Uh, Great to be here. Thank you. All right. So having said that, let's, let's move to the, the uh, key topic. The number one question was, the company share structure. So it's been, uh, how can I put this? It, it's been one of the topics that most shareholders have been somewhat confused about the actual numbers that have been displayed, uh, that have been presented by the message boards <laughs> and the conflicting numbers. Let me clarify that for you today. So the company share structure is as of today, Transfer agent verified is the issued and outstanding common shares of the company are 1,710,154,437 shares. That is the total issued and outstanding common shares of the company as of today. The free trading shares, also the float, which is recorded in CD and Co as of today, is 1,386,000,000. 493,682 shares, which is extremely close to what we reported in our September 30th filing. So there, there's very little change in the amount of shares that's in the float from September 30th to today's date. 
So I'm hoping that clears up any uh, um, uncertainties as to the actual numbers. These are the official numbers. And as I said, this is as of today. So uh, that's, that's relative to the share structure per se. Um, one of the other big topics that was, has been probably number two on the list is the distributor status. So the company has currently uh, a total of eight international distributors already signed up, six US distributors um, that are all operational at this time. They're buying products. And one of the um, reasons that we, we haven't published them collectively is one of the requirements for our website for distributors is to have their complete inventory available, including ours, listed on their profile uh, on there so that when clients, customers can call uh, or order online, the product is available. So to that point, what we have done now, we're in the final stages of completely updating our distributor uh, profile on the website. All distributors will be listed with their contact information, their website, uh, and ability to purchase products. And as I stated a few minutes ago, that does include eight international and six US, along with our own presence, of course, with our uh, e-commerce platform. So we, we will be publishing additional updates um, as we add new distributors. And in our quarterly report, which is uh, ending December 31st in a few days, uh, in that filing, we'll be including the revenues attached to that uh, from those distributors um, to give an overall summary of the, the quarterly report per se. Um, distributors are selling products. Um, the, the reviews coming back to the company are really, really promising for the future. So again, we'll update that both in our quarterly report and in our distributor tabs and news on the website. Um, one, of the, one of the additional biggest questions was the uh, announcement we made regarding the wholesale personal protection equipment or PPE products for $2 billion that we announced in this quarter. Um, I, I'm going to give some clarification to that now. Um, there are some exceptions that I, I can't disclose at this time due to uh, significant NDA requirements, but I'm going to give the parameters and I'm going to give the, the numbers attached to that. So uh, we were hoping to have this um, contract and it is a contract, completed by December 31st. But uh, due to the increase in the pandemic globally, and particularly here in the US, put a little pressure on the manufacturers for to provide the product that we were supplying, as the medical industry in general put additional demand on them for products. So whilst moving forward, um, we are fulfilling the contract our completion date is probably now closer to February 15th, uh, at which time uh, we will have hopefully fully completed that contract and be able to announce uh, all of the revenues attached to that within the uh, first quarter of 2021. Our, our goal was originally uh, to announce that by December 31st in 2020, but of course, due to the pandemic and the product supply slowed us down a little bit, but still moving forward. What I can tell you um, comfortably today is that on completion of that product, uh, the revenues to the company, the gross revenues to the company from that are expected to exceed over $100 million uh, from, from the sales of the uh, wholesale PPE products. In addition to our regular revenues, which again, uh, for December 31st will be published in the uh, Q1 uh, filing for 2021. So the PPE wholesale product, very, very strong for us. Uh, it was a big opportunity for this company to grow. For a, a pink sheet company to have an opportunity like that um, and take it to these whole new levels was, re was really uh, 
a significant gift for us and we protect it very well and we anticipate future growth with new contracts after the completion of this one. Um, what, the, what the $2 billion contract basically was for people that have not been aware of that was it's, uh, it's wholesale supply of medical um, masks for surgical use, hospital use, doctors, dentists, the medical industry in general, uh, along with the nitrile gloves. These were essential to uh, protective care for our frontline workers across the country and actually globally. Uh, the demand globally is, is turned into a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And, uh, it, you know, we, we've had the opportunity and uh, and taking moving forward with fulfilling these contracts. And there are more opportunities we receive on a weekly basis, but, but we're right now we're focused on completing this huge $2 billion contract uh, that we were fortunate enough to procure. So um, what that also led to for us was to expand our warehouse operations. We, we have a 22,000 square foot facility that is now pretty much jammed wall to wall with daily uh, uh, tractor trailers uh, operating in and out of there for both deliveries and, and shipping. So it's a pretty exciting project and uh, it keeps moving forward. What I can add to that uh, as this industry grows, and we may need to do this um, even before mid-February is uh, expand the growth to an additional facility for uh, product storage and distribution. We have uh, been looking close by, the uh, within a few hundred yards actually, where we're located at our corporate office here in Vista. Our uh, current facility is about 150 yards away. We, we've been looking at a newer, larger facility in addition to those two that is probably about 300 yards away, but it, it's significantly larger. But as, that, as we have updates on that, and if we do for, um, complete that transaction to expand, obviously we'll do that by uh, press release and, and public dissemination. So that's, that's where we're at with the, the $2 billion contract. And for a lot of the people that didn't believe it's real, it's actually real. And the way that we announced that was through the proper channels as a, um, we, we did announce with an 8K prior to uh, press release. And we, we did um, notify FINRA ahead of the press release. And then of course we disseminated the public information as required because it is a, a significant event for the company. So that's clarification on the PPE deal and uh, an estimate uh, of the gross profits that we anticipate uh, from that contract. Okay, now from there, uh, and th those type of profits, one of the other questions is, would there be a stock buyback in the future? Uh, and that, that's a pretty popular question. Because of the, um, the toxic notes that were that did cause some serious dilution into the company, but it has stabilized. And of course we fulfilled repayment of all of those toxic notes, which helped stabilize the stock and the value. Um, what, we, what we are contemplating right now is from the proceeds of the $2 billion contract, we are contemplating a stock buyback um, program. Um, it's tough to say at this time when that will occur, but we, we would like to see that in effect in Q1 of 2021, um, using the proceeds from that to reduce the amount of shares that are outstanding, common shares that are outstanding in the company and in, in the marketplace. So um, yes, it's something we're contemplating. We're taking it very seriously. Um, if we can use the proceeds from the large contracts do that, obviously um, it, it, it would have significant benefits to the value of the company and it would be taken from the profits and whatever stock was purchased, we would of course uh, 
retire to treasury and cancel out the stock. So it would reduce the number of shares issued outstanding. So that, that's a little bit about the uh, potential stock buyback. You know, along with that, um, a lot of the questions have been, well, if we, are we going back to fully reporting status? The answer to that is, that is our full intent. We've already um, retained new accounting services They've already started the work to prepare everything for us to bring everything back to an audit level so that we can file for our QB status. Uh, again, we would like to have that completed early in Q1 2021 with the further intent of actually upgrading the company uh, or applying for NASDAQ status um, because of the company's revenues now, future revenues. We meet most of the criteria other than the stock price. One of the questions, one of the most popular questions asked by the shareholders is, well, does that in include a reverse split to meet the criteria of the $4 stock price? Our, our answer to that is there is a lower criteria of $2 a share with certain qualifications that we feel that um, by the end of Q1 2021 or the beginning of uh, Q2 2021, and with the growth of the company, the revenues, the profits, and the expansion, I think we might automatically qualify in that $2 price range to uh, per share to actually meet the criteria to move to NASDAQ. Um, that's our goal. We're going to try hard to achieve that. And uh, I think we could absolutely uh, make that work. And uh, so, so that's our goal. Um, along with that comes the question of, will this involve a reverse split? Our goal, is, the answer to that is, that's not our goal. At this time, uh, we don't anticipate uh, having to effect a reverse split. It's not in our immediate plans and it's not in our uh, foreseeable plans. We're, we're going to try and move this up to the NASDAQ level on its own merit, its growth, and uh, I think the stock price should fall in line with the, the profitability of the company for the next two quarters to come. So uh, along with that also, obviously, as I mentioned previously, yes, we're, we're preparing now the, uh, the financials for for audit status, obviously, um, company's been alternative reporting for over a year now. Um, we, we, we're very confident with the accounting firm that we've retained that are already working on this, as I, I previously said, particularly now that the uh, toxic debt has been eliminated from the books of the company. Um, so that's a little bit about the share structure, where we're going, uh, no plans for a reverse split, plans to upgrade to NASDAQ in the not too distant future. Okay, one of the other big questions was uh, our cell phone and tablet patent status. As everyone knows in, uh, I think in June of this year, we were fortunate enough to uh, file for uh, patent status for integration of UBC lighting, uh, UBC light technology, I should say, into smartphones and uh, tablets. Um, we, we filed that a uh, little bit tongue in cheek, uh, thinking that we really wouldn't get that because it was such a broad spectrum, but uh, the sun uh, shined on us with that and we did actually receive that patent. Uh, it's patent pending, and I think we should have full status by the end of Q2 for that. Um, now, now, that is for, as I said, that's for the UBC technology. Basically, it's a, a version of the iWand integrated into uh, smartphones and to tablets. So to make basically sterilization uh, on demand using your, your smartphone. So it's, it's uh, to us, it was was pretty obvious we should go that route. And as I said, we were able to achieve that. Um, on a little bit of a uh, pat on the back, 
type of note with that. Uh, we learned that after we were awarded the uh, patent pending status, I, I believe Apple filed for the same uh, technology in uh, about two weeks after we received it, the uh, the patent. So, uh, the, and of course they didn't get it because we already had it. So we know that we're, we feel comfortable knowing that we're playing in the the correct sector for this moving forward. The, the, the way of the future for UV, UVC scanning technology to both personal and commercial use is, is in the phones and the tablets. Very comfortable with that. A lot. Shortly after that, we also filed uh, a similar patent using our temperature scanning technology to be integrated into the uh, same cell phones and uh, tablets. And uh, we were fortunate enough to achieve that too. So lots of opportunities in the future for, um, for, for those patents for us. And we, we put a conservative evaluation on those uh, in our last filing of $2.5 million for each of the patents. Very conservative. Um, and we actually didn't include it in the total. We just did it in the subsequent events to show that we had, that, that was our provisional valuation. We currently have it out with a professional, uh, both patents out with a professional uh, group for uh, complete evaluation, which we hope to, we can hope to have had it back by December 31st, and we still may, but as soon as we have those valuations, we'll make them public as well. Um, the goal for that is not for us to be in production with uh, smartphones, cell phones, and, and tablets, but to license that technology to some of the larger phone uh, manufacturers, carriers, um, and basically take uh, long-term royalties from those licenses, uh, you know, for residual income for a long time to come for the benefit of the company. So, so that's where we're at with, with the two patents. Uh, we were fortunate, as I said, enough to have them, and uh, we look forward to the valuation in the future business. Uh, and hopefully being approached by uh, one of the larger carriers or, or uh, manufacturers of the smart devices. A lot of the other questions we've had uh, uh, relative to our fuel maximizer, and the fuel maximizer was something that actually started this business uh, almost six years ago. It was our entry into a, a greener, cleaner environment we developed the fuel maximizer product to reduce emissions, increase fuel economy, and uh, increase performance simultaneously. And that was across the board for both gasoline and diesel engines um, and vehicles and equipment of all shapes and sizes. We're one of the few companies that have achieved a number of uh, California Air Resource Executive Orders for that. Um, they're listed on the Air Resources Board website. If you would like to Google that, it's um, California Air Resources Board, uh, .gov, I believe. And uh, if you put in executive orders for uh, optimized fuel technologies, which is the Optic device uh, developer, the, um, you should be able to see that. If not, re reach out to us and we'll provide you with the executive orders numbers and uh, you, you can take a look at them yourself. But what that does, basically achieving those orders allows us to use the, or install those devices on vehicles and equipment in California, which is one of the most stringent uh, air pollution and emission uh, requirements throughout the world. And wherever you try to sell a product like that, um, the first thing, whether it's in Africa, New Zealand, Australia, California, or anywhere in the world, the first thing you're asked is, do you have CARB executive orders for that product, which, meet, which basically means it meets all the California requirements. And we have a number of those, as I stated. So um, we, we're still moving forward with our fuel maximizer products. And, been slowed down a little bit by the pandemic, of course, uh, most of the focus on essential only items. 
But in that sector, I, I can give you a little bit of a preview into where we are moving forward with the Maximizer products. We're working on an R&D uh, um, project with a East Coast company that have been working and have several patents with a, a similar technology or a technology that produces similar results. And we've been working in conjunction with them to combine the two um, to see if we can achieve better levels of fuel economy and emission reduction. And to date, uh, it, it's very promising. We're hoping probably by the end of January to be able to publish uh, some certified third-party results on, on the fuel technology and uh, reintroduce it to some of the larger logistics companies, uh, marine applications, uh, and commercial power generation, uh, and everything that we, we can uh, do to help with the environment uh, for that. So the fuel maximizer is still very, very much in, in our uh, portfolio. So a lot of people were asking about that. So today I wanted to clear that, uh, to clarify that point. Um, I, I'd like to introduce Kevin Harrington now, um, if I may, and uh, then let Kevin know his, his involvement with the company. You can hear it directly from him. Um, his future roles with us uh, and where we're going um, in that direction. And then I will, I'll pick up with some of the uh, additional items after Kevin has spoken. Kevin, please. Okay. Thank you, Roger. I really appreciate it. I just want to say I'm very excited about uh, about Optech and the future. Um, I got involved because I believe the timing is, is, is perfect. I mean, UVC is kind of, I call it the new now. It's everywhere you turn, everyone's using it. Airlines, restaurants, uh, it's a potential lifesaver that is proven to kill germs. And so um, we, we've been working on a direct to the consumer marketing campaign, building a funnel, um, this is all in process. It's a robust, uh, 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 it's a very robust commerce platform, and we're going to have online marketing campaigns with um, with uh, ads driving uh, videos to the bottom of this funnel. And this is what we do for all of our products. And and we're just, um, you know, this is all coming together right now. And um, with everything happening in the world, we feel that the timing is good. The, uh, the opportunity is here. And the, the iWand product is the first product we're starting with. And, you know, the iWand kills germs, it sanitizes surfaces, it, it you know, works in packages, airplanes, restaurants, et cetera. Uh, but we also will be integrating many other PPE products along the way, including the hydroxyl air sanitizer, which Dr. Drew is excited about. And Dr. Steve Mandel brought that project to the table, as well as uh, uh, rather Dr. Drew, as well as the biomask. So um, that's uh, uh, my my start here, and and um, I'll open uh, to questions. Roger, any anything else? No, we we greatly appreciate having you on our advisory board, Kevin, and we're looking forward oh. to all of the projects we have together and uh, the launch of the the new digital marketing campaign. Very excited. Thanks for coming on board today, Kevin, and uh, re reiterating to uh, your support and involvement with the company. Thank you very much. Hey, great to be here. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kevin Harrington. And uh, we, on a on another note, there was a recent. Uh, this was probably the the twelfth most important question on our. Uh, uh, portfolio today is the uh, fraudulent press release that was published by unknown persons uh, just over a week ago. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I want to address this. Um, uh, just, I just want to hit it head on to be candid with you. I mean, uh, yes, it was totally fraudulent. The company had clearly had no knowledge of it. Um, and we you know, we, we did put out a statement to that effect. And uh, because it addressed Target and Walmart, Walmart were absolutely inundated with calls. And of course, uh, they themselves put out a press release uh, to, to announce that, that, 
that they were not involved in that in, in any way. And at this time, the, there is no d direct uh, uh, negotiations with, with uh, Optech for carrying products uh, in their stores. That's at this time. But on the, on the fraudulent press release side of things, uh, it, it was pretty apparent that uh, it wasn't published through our uh, access wire or with our permission. Um, and I, I, I truly think that uh, the parties that put that together it was for, for gain. They either had stock or wanted to increase or inflate the price of the stock to um, make some money for Christmas. Uh, the, the cost of you know, the, the real shareholders attached in this deal. So whilst um, it, it's pretty sad, but I, I'm sure that uh, regulatory authorities, particularly the SEC, ha have this under control now. And uh, all of the relevant links that were attached to that, of course, have vanished. So I don't think they're going to have a hard time finding out who did that. But I just wanted to be clear about this. The company had no involvement whatsoever in that Um wouldn't make a statement like that unless it was fully documented and we had everything uh, to support that. So many people were unsure as to whether it was some type of error by the company. The answer is no, absolutely not. Not involved, Walmart were not involved and Target were not involved in, in any of that. So, um, so, so that really on that is one of the, the questions and concerns that um, on this webinar uh, was one of the most popular uh, topics. So we wanted to address that for sure. On a very positive note, uh, we've been moving forward with a lot of our uh, existing products on our regular PPE, uh, including our iWans, Rovers, temperature scanners, biomasks, and a lot of other uh, new products that we're bringing to the table. We're very excited to do that. Um, we, we, we are introducing, uh, in January, an advanced version of the Rovers, um, actually automated versions of the Rovers, which a lot of people have been asking, is that something that's coming? The answer is yes. Um, we're in the final stages of testing for that, for the prototypes. Uh, we're pretty excited about that and, uh, we'll be updating everything again, uh, through press releases and our website. And with the new Rovers, they're, they're based on um, both domestic, commercial, residential, educational, and municipalities uses, but these are far more advanced versions uh, than, than we are currently bringing to market. And on that point with the Rovers, we, we get really good reviews for those products. They work extremely well. Uh, the ratings are pretty much all five-star uh, as we as we go through uh, all of the the uh, reviews that come back to us, it's like it, it's it's very encouraging. So, uh, one of the other things that we we want to talk about uh, is you know the company is launching a new website. Uh, it's in, it's in the final stages, uh, probably within the next week. Absolutely, maximum two weeks. The the new Optech International website will be launched. Uh, it will integrate everything that you see on all the other websites. So everything will be consolidated into that new website, including uh, the stock information, product sales, uh, technology. It, it's a pretty comprehensive site, and uh, we're we're pretty happy with it. So. Um, Companies moving forward, want to thank everyone for their support. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been a, a tough year for a, a lot of individuals, for a lot of companies. We were fortunate enough to be able to uh, help in this sector during this pandemic, and we've continued to grow. It's been, you know, and we, we want to help. We, we want to help everyone. And basically, in concluding, finally, thank everyone for their continued support and belief in Optic's mission towards helping create a safer 
cleaner environment uh, across the world. So thank you for participating today. I'm Roger Parson, CEO of Optech International. Thanks again to Kevin Harrington. And I'd like everyone to stay safe for the future and a happy new year. Thank you, Roger Paulson and Kevin Harrington for participating in today's call. To all guests, in the event you have a follow-up question or question that was not answered during this call, please send to Optech International's Investor Relations contact, Andrew Barwicky at andrew at barwicky.com. Also, if you tuned in late or didn't happen to catch today's event, within 24 to 48 hours, a recording of today's call will be posted on the company's website, that's www.optechintl.com. I want to thank everyone again for joining us today. We wish you all a happy and most importantly, a healthy 2021. Take care.